Hi friends, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. I've known Sensei Hayes since 1980, and I first trained with him in 1984, and then I moved out to Ohio in 1999 to be his full-time student from Massachusetts to here in Ohio, where I now live 25 years later. This is a special time for me. I went to Mr. Hayes' house. We live about 45 minutes away from each other, and I interviewed him, and I asked him a bunch of questions about his history and his future, of course. The interview is broken up into small parts, which will be distributed over the next couple of weeks or even months. Mr. Hayes holds nothing back. At age 75, he tells it like it is. And I don't agree with everything that he says, but I'm happy I asked the questions that I did. This is his time, his interview, his opportunity to set the record straight on a couple of topics. There are thousands of you out there just like me who were influenced by Sensei Hayes, read all of his books, and started to follow the path of the samurai and the ninja. Without Sensei Hayes, this dojo and dozens of other dojos around the world would not be there. He is a Black Belt Hall of Fame member, a shining star in the martial arts, and a pioneer in American ninjutsu. Much of the martial arts and the opportunities that they bring are a direct result of Mr. Hayes' efforts over the years. So here's part one of my interview with Anshu Stephen K. Hayes. Not unlike you with Hatsumi Sensei, I, I, I went off and did my own thing um, with our dojo down in Mason and wanted to blend Toshin Do and even some aspects of the Bujin Khan and form my own way of doing things, which is not always smart and good, um, but I never lost connection with you and, and your purpose and what you're doing. And today I wanted to share with a younger audience all the stuff that you've done for the martial arts and just kind of get a more intimate look at how you do things, your writing, your opinions on the school system and how to run a dojo, what you're doing now, your history with the Bujin Khan, I think it's important to touch on, and then your legacy. I think this is really important because at your age you're getting a lot of awards, you're getting recognized more for all of the work you put in over the decades so many books you've written that have influenced all martial arts styles from the 80s on and still doing to this day. So these shadows that you've created, such as me and now my students and now their students, two, three generations on, and now the five-year-olds are coming up, that's two, three. Your power is immense in such a small community as the martial arts, which in the world isn't big. Very few people do martial arts, but I'm so happy that I've maintained contact with you as a type of father figure. Many of us have the same love for you, and I'm just happy that you opened your house up today <laughs> for me. What are you doing now that you're out of the so, quote-unquote, day-to-day commercial dojo? I don't want to say you're retired because you're still very busy, but with your time now, what are you doing with your time mostly? Well, you know, I'll be 75 in just a couple of weeks, and that's a pretty significant transition. So several years ago, we decided, no, we should sell the dojo, uh, kind of return back to my original inspiration in the 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, what am I looking for? What do I want to do? So, I mean, we, we do seminars in this dojo. We can handle maybe 18, 20 people in here. If it's a meditation, maybe 22. Uh, so we do that several times a year. I do a lot of Zooms. Even physical technique mm. uh, amazes me. I have the other person get a training partner and they act it out. And sometimes Rumiko uh, acts as my training partner. And we do a lot of uh, the meditation or spiritual development through Zooms. I still travel a tiny little bit, but I prefer to stay here at my yeah. home and have other people come in. You know, I mean, it is a uh, kind of unique place. Uh, and I think the, the travel and coming here and being out in the woods and so secluded and then here in the dojo or in our dining area, you know, it, it has a kind of a binding effect you know, with, with people. Uh, I'm not just a guy in a shopping center teaching how to defend yourself. There's a holistic life style.
So. Well, you explain that this is a the <clears throat> title Anshu has to do with a hermitage, right? It does. So, can you explain what that means, Anshu, and why it applies to this? Well, you know, when we first started Toshindo back in the mid '90s, you know, different advisors, oh, what title are you going to give yourself? And I said, oh, I don't really need a title. No, you need a title. You're head of Toshindo. And you could be like the Dai Shihan, Great Shihan, or uh, Soke, head of the family. And I said, we don't even know if this is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these are preposterous titles. So Rumiko and I came up with this title, An Shu. An is a hermitage. It's a very humble little retreat building on a bigger temple ground in Japan. And it's where a monk or a warrior would go just to kind of relax, mm -hmm. rejuvenate, reset, contemplate, get away from the craziness. And so it's the retreat hut, I call it. That's the on. And Shu is, uh, it is a, uh, like the person who's in charge of. Mm. So sometimes we translate that as master in Japan, in English, like mm. the stable master or the range master. Mm. Doesn't mean, it just the one who's running it, an shu, the, the, the person who runs the retreat hut. <laughs> That's mm. my title. Mm -hmm. So people think it means like great ninja or super <laughs> warrior. Nah, guy who runs the retreat hut and, uh, this house is well, a little more elaborate than an on, but I call it the on anyway. Mm -hmm. And I can invite people to come and join me here. And you have, you spent decades on a spiritual quest as well. Do you believe that to get a full package of martial arts, you can't just have the physical, the beating each other up on the mat, so to speak. You have to have something to go on with it, whether it's morals or ethics. You can leave religion out of it, but you need something to drive the mind with the techniques itself. Uh, and many other martial arts don't focus on that at all. They don't do any mind science, there's no code of ethics. And you would agree that if you just learn a martial art, you become a brute, powerful bully in many ways. If you're not guided, you can go to the dark side very easily as you can go to the light. I always say that martial arts doesn't necessarily make you a better person, it brings out who you already are. So if you're a bright light, which you talk about, you become brighter. But if you're a negative person and you get into martial arts, you can become a real kind of evil uh, karate kid, you know, the negative sensei on that. How important is your opinion on some sort of spiritual compendium to go along with the physical? From my experience? From your experience. It is absolutely undeniably required. Mm. And I know I go against a lot of, maybe even the majority of martial artists. They just teach a technique and they say, oh, you can learn discipline. Well, you can learn discipline playing tennis, uh, handball, uh, shooting pool. What's the difference? Well, it teaches you balance. Well, you can learn balance riding a bicycle. What's the difference? Uh, you know, people try to, well, we don't want to bring religion into it. No, I don't want to bring religion into it either. But you definitely need an inner exploration. Why are these fights happening if you're getting into fights? A lot of times we may subconsciously, unconsciously, uh, from the depths of our being, prompt a conflict without even knowing it. Mm -hmm. um, hey, how, who am I? How do I relate? And if I'm really skilled, if I'm really strong, I mean, I am invincible, means I can be that much more compassionate. Mm -hmm. I don't have to prove anything to some idiot on the street who's, well, I say idiot, but maybe he had a bad life. You know, uh, he was abused, uh, he was picked on, um, and he found words didn't work, uh, thoughts didn't work. Uh, I'm going to learn how to make that person hurt as much as I hurt. And if we, we, we need to understand that. You know, we're dealing with somebody who is a damaged individual. Uh, do we have to get in a fight with them? Uh, no. So I really think that that self-discovery, and we have like five elements that kind of describe 
where we're kind of coming from. Some people are very stable, solid. They don't have much to say. When they say it, it's like thunder and lightning. And you get others that are real chatty and uh, they'll go all over the place and you know, these different personality aspects. Learn about yourself. Learn how that could be a tool mm. used by a really clever enemy to pull you in to a fight that you had no intention of getting into in the first place. See, I mean, we're really dealing with real fighting. There's no sport application where I come in second place and I compliment the winner. No, no, there is no second place. Uh, it's not an art form where we do abstract movements or anything like that. Everything has got to relate to a practical resolution of conflict and confrontation. Um, there are health benefits, uh, but this is a very practical self-defense thing, and it is crucial that that be matched by some internal reference, as, as you mentioned, uh, a code of ethics. If I can destroy another human being, what's to keep me from randomly doing that, becoming a monster, mm. uh, even if I don't think I'm a monster? Oh no, I'm, I'm going to show this bad person. I'm going to give them a lesson. Legally, you may not do that. And that's another whole problem these days, the court system. I get pretty political on that myself, but I've seen so many re unbelievable decisions on the court. You go to court, some, and the dirtbags always get good lawyers. Uh, <laughs> you go to court, the first thing that prosecutor is going to ask you, how long have you been studying this Japanese assassin method? Oh, God. They say, well, a lot shorter time than your client has been a repeat felon. Nope, nope, nope. You can't bring that up. Yeah. Can't bring up his past. We're only looking at right here. And I mean, it's just tragic. And now with these video phones, a fight starts, everybody videos, and you can edit that very carefully and just show so you have to be careful what you say yes. in a fight yes. so we even have verbal kata that people practice just so that when they're under pressure and they're coming from a lower part of the brain they don't say something stupid like well yeah well bring it on buddy oh god that's one of the things we teach at our dojo and a brilliant thing that you established in toshin do which i didn't see anywhere in the classical uh, Taijutsu schools, maybe a few teachers, they wouldn't even address what to say when you're defending because cameras are everywhere, cameras, audios everywhere. So if you can learn to use your voice, first of all, you know, it keeps you breathing. Mm -hmm. It tells your intention. Sometimes your voice is the most powerful weapon you can have because it goes around corners, it goes through walls, you can't punch through a wall. And you can sometimes command an opponent and scare the heck out of them even if you look a little psychotic by yelling, they'll back away. And like this, yeah. I'm not going to engage with this. So our youth students and the adults, we, we use, like you said, the verbal jujitsu, you could call it, where we're setting up the law. We are saying these words, stop, leave me alone, I don't want trouble, so that a lawyer is going to pick up on this. Even though we're both going to be arrested and go to court to lose everything, even though there's a right and wrong, clearly. Yeah. At least the lawyer's like, this, this person that was defending himself, Japanese assassin or not, was saying, stop, leave me alone, don't do that, back away. And most martial arts, you're taught, shut up, be quiet, don't say anything, just breathe. They're missing out on this intelligent audio martial arts that is so important nowadays in this litigious society. We are going to go to court. We need to protect ourselves with what we say during, before, and after the conflict. Absolutely. What you say to the police, and I mean, that's their, their obligation is to get you talking. Yeah. And you say the wrong thing, it's recorded. You can't ever take it back. Um, but see, that's the difference between 1500s Japan and 2024, 2025 America. It's vastly different. Mm -hmm. If you got in a fight in old Japan, it was death or victory. Yeah. And there was no 911 to call. There were no prosecutors who were going to get elected by having more convictions. Oh, 
none of that existed. It was you and him, and one of you was going to win, and one of you was going to die. And so if you study that only and think, well, I'm studying self-defense for the modern world, you're totally wrong. Mm -hmm. You're totally wrong. You have the totally wrong attitude. I mean, when I studied the in Japan in the 70s, we would start out at a great distance. Today, confrontation starts very close. Mm. Confrontation starts with some kind of verbalization. Hey, what are you looking at, buddy? You know? Hey, quit staring at my girl. I'm not staring at your girl. Oh, you call me a liar? You, oh, come on. I mean, it, and these guys are trained on how to do this stupid stuff. Didn't exist in the 1500s Japan.